Hello, my name is Jeff Parker. I'm a professor of engineering at Dartmouth College, and I'm also a research fellow at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. It's my distinct pleasure to come to you in this video format um, to join you at the Digital Economy Forum held in Seoul, Korea. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few things that come out of our recent book, Platform Revolution. So I think one of the first things to understand is just how much the world has changed um, in the sense of a change of places from traditional companies and the more digitally oriented companies. Um, so to make the point, if you go back to just 2001, um, you can see that the primary firms um, that held the top market capitalizations were in energy and finance. And as you go forward, that's true in 2006 and still true in 2011. However, by the time you get to 2016, you can see that there's been a complete changing of the guard and that the leading firms have all got the element that they are exchanging bits instead of atoms as the primary way that they're creating value. This has been tremendously disruptive to the previous leaders. And if you look at the market caps, um, just to put into context um, how much change there's been, oil and banking are both roughly about one and a half to two trillion dollars um, for the top seven firms. But if you look at the top seven technology firms, it's roughly five trillion dollars, even after some of the recent uh, kind of downturns in the market. Um, that have taken place over the last couple of months. Um, and so as you can see, uh, the tech companies have really, uh, have really displaced the previous leaders. Um, that's particularly important because a lot of this value is getting generated in ways that don't require huge asset investments. Um, so if you take a look at oil and gas and you think about the technology that you have to put into place, it takes tremendous assets um, from the oil rigs, um, to the refining and processing plants, um, to the transportation systems that you use to manage offshore oil and gas. Um, the whole enterprise um, takes on the order of tens of billions of dollars for any one field, and the industry consumes several hundred billion dollars of capital expense um, in any given year. So just tremendously asset heavy. And on the flip side, the platform firms are often asset light. So the sort of standard examples of Airbnb or Uber are systems where they're really taking spare capacity that's in the economy and then creating markets to exchange that spare capacity to create value. One of the things that I think has been uh, particularly interesting is the degree to which the platforms have been very concentrated in Asia and in North America. Um, of course, you've got the, the kind of California and Seattle firms of uh, Microsoft and Apple and Google and Facebook. Um, and then you've also got the giants in China of Tencent and Alibaba. Um, you have some presence in Europe and interestingly, some presence in Africa and of course in Japan. Um, but the important point is that there's been concentration and so the, the countries and regions that don't have big platform presences are asking the question, well, you know, what do we do? How do we think about this? What are the regulatory issues? Um, and how big of a problem is this uh, in the long run? Um, one of the interesting things that we talk about a lot is the fact that most startup firms, or at least many of them, will use the word platform or some kind of market mechanism, and we'll be talking about the network effects that they hope to harness in order to build out their business models. Many existing firms uh, that, that exchange products and services are also looking at how they might adapt and change themselves to become platforms. We would hold that all firms are going to have to deal with platforms, and so we think it's worth spending just a few minutes to look at some of their structure. Um, so to start with, we'd say, well, if we're going to define a platform, let's at least start with what one isn't. So we think a lot about a pipe model, which is this linear value chain, which is the way that most of us as, as kind of managers and, and scientists and business people 
have come to view the world, and we think of it as securing some source of supply, transforming that supply of materials into some kind of, of subsystems and components, and then assembling those subsystems and components into some final product, and then getting that final product out to a market. And then the idea is that the money flows back up the chain in order to then compensate all of the supply chain partners. Um, the challenge here is that although value accumulates from stage to stage, you're really optimizing flows that go in a single direction and there don't tend to be strong network effects um, by which we mean users who create value for other users so that the systems get more valuable with the number of people who join. Um, by contrast, when we think of a platform, we think of these as a triangular system that facilitates the direct interactions of one type of user of the platform, often a demand side user, and the other type of user, often a supply side user. And then the platform provides the resources of matching, potentially some contracting, financial flows, and they may provide direct technology blocks that facilitate the production and the consumption of particular value that's being exchanged across a platform. Um, so to make that a bit more concrete, uh, let's look at the example of something like Google when they did their search. So at the beginning, they had effectively the better PageRank algorithm, and so they were able to attract a number of users for the quality of the search results. Then they monetized by opening the system up to another side, which was advertisers. And then over time, they became multi-sided and then brought additional firms in to help the advertiser side you know, optimize and improve the services that they were offering. Platforms tend to get even more complicated over time as they build out and start to orchestrate a larger ecosystem. So why are platforms so special? Well, we would argue that they're among the most powerful business models ever invented, and the reasons are twofold. One is that they tend to have strong supply-side economies of scale. That is, you're dealing with large fixed costs and low variable costs. And then on top of that, you add the power of network effects, which means that the more people who use the system, the more valuable it becomes. So these can have very high margins, um, and some examples here are on the order of 70% for eBay, 60% for Etsy. The growth can be exponential, and the network effects and the low cost structures can make them quite defensible for a very long period of time. It's also interesting to note that platforms tend to scale faster than pipes because you don't have to go through the cycle of capital investment that then builds out your production systems if you're kind of more in a supply chain world. We do see the case where firms will both operate supply chains to produce um, the physical goods, you know, such as one of these mobile devices, um, at the same time that they'll also be operating platforms that then interact with some of the physical goods. And I think Apple is a classic case of that and Samsung is working hard to move in that direction. Um, and then out to the right on the slide, you can see that your Airbnbs and Ubers operate with almost no assets other than the data centers um, and are able to orchestrate a whole set of resources that they don't own. So to summarize, we think of platforms as a nexus of rules and architectures. And then we think of them as open to the degree that they can allow for external parties to attach to the system and then create value. And then the platform, because it's dealing with so many external actors, needs to think carefully about governance and regulation so that it can actively promote good things that create value while also detecting those bad actors who destroy value for other people in the system. So to summarize and kind of close this very short introduction, um, we think there are a number of important strategies uh, for industrial firms to think as, as they deal with platforms um, and where their strategies might be. Um, 
So of course they could transition to become a platform or partner with other firms um, to sponsor a platform, um, or they might end up selling their products and services across the platform. And in all of these cases, they have to worry about maintaining a strong customer facing presence so that they don't end up getting suppressed down um, and then having the platform become the primary interface and the primary brand that customers see. There's always going to be some kind of a fight over the customer relationship. Um, but the point is that you're going to want to avoid getting into price wars because, of course, that helps um, dominant platforms, whereas the industrial firms are, you know, aren't looking for that direct head-to-head -head, um, price competition. Um, in order to maintain your sets of options, it's important to think that you might multi-home um, and then have the ability to switch technology if necessary. And then I think one of the most important things is to think carefully about uh, the data and the way that you gather the data and then do your artificial intelligence and do your machine learning within your specific industry niche. And then the race that you're going to be uh, encountering against the big sort of general technology firms um, is going to be, can you learn faster within your niche then the big players such as um, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or the Google Cloud offerings, um, all of those are also gathering data and learning quickly. Um, and so the game is, well, can I do this within automotive or I can do it within um, oil and gas or within shipbuilding or some kind of manufacturing industry and learn even faster because I've got a technical um, expertise uh, that comes from my long history of engineering and product development and participating in those markets. Um, and some of this will really echo some of the outsourcing issues um, from a generation ago where firms had to think carefully about, well, what did they ask their outsourcing partners and supply chain partners to do and what was core to the firm that they had to keep inside. Um, so it's been a real pleasure uh, to just introduce some of these ideas. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful conference. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me in this virtual sense. Take care.